guess what everyone? I've been sewing for a year, woo! August of 2020, I began my sewing journey and I wanted to show you all what I've created over the past 12 months. Now, normally everyone does these everything I've sewn in a year videos at the end of the year around December or January, but instead I wanted to do a bit of a different take and release it 12 months after I actually began sewing. Like with everything in life, there were a lot of ups and downs, but I would say more so positives rather than negatives. And I have definitely learned a ton of new skills in order to take with me into my next 12 months of sewing. And yes, I am wearing the exact same outfit that I wore in my last video because I'm actually filming this intro and outro on the exact same day. So hello, future everybody. I decided rather than trying on all of the things that I've made over the year and creating brand new footage, because I am very meticulous about the type of footage that I like to release, I decided that it would be better to recycle some of the shots that were already taken, especially where possible. Obviously, I have sewn some things that haven't been fully video documented, so for those ones, I did of course go ahead and make new footage. I have sewn some smaller things as well for other people, which I am not going to be including in this list because I just don't really want to count it in the things that I've made exclusively for myself. I will go into some of the estimates of how long I think each garment took to sew. Some of you may know that all the garments that I make for myself are hand sewn and so obviously everything that I made over the year is as well. Because of that, of course, it took me a lot longer than it would if, say, I used a machine. I hope you enjoy all of this footage of the very first year of my sewing journey. And I'm really looking forward to sharing all of the projects that are to come over the course of the next year. In August 2020, I set upon an undertaking that I had been considering for a long while. My grandmother sews indigenous hats and other forms of dress as well, so I grew up seeing her crafting and making plenty of items. When I started wearing historical clothing every day a couple of years ago, I figured at some point I probably wanted to start sewing my own too. But I never really enjoyed sewing with a sewing machine. Electric sewing machines frankly scare me. I learned to make a straight stitch on a machine as a child, but that was essentially the complete extent of what I understood about sewing going into this adventure. I sometimes get asked how I learned historical sewing, and my answer is through YouTube and other online resources. Almost everything I've learned has been from free information, though I do try to leave donations to other creators when I can, as a thanks. I knew in the beginning of this journey that I needed a simple project that would help me practice some of the primary hand stitches. So I learned a few stitches and I decided to make a Regency style shift or chemise. Now I'm not really a fan of Regency clothing all that much, but looking at garments, they seemed far more beginner friendly than some of the more complex Victorian or Georgian options that I was interested in. Being that this shift is my first project, it's an absolute mess, but still very wearable. I crafted it from an extremely thin muslin-like fabric, and it gathers in at the neckline with a thin silk ribbon. In all, I would estimate that it took me somewhere around 20 hours to hand sew. Building upon the Regency shift, I knew the next project I wanted to make would be a gown. But because of my daily wear, I wanted something practical and wearable. I opted for this day gown made from a pleasantly blue cotton and wool fabric, which provides the garment with a little extra warmth. I don't wear short sleeves very often, so I of course opted for long sleeves, I should mention that I did not sew the fichu or the cap. I've added links down below to the shops where I get some of my extra accessories. At this point in my progression, I really didn't understand how to fit a garment and also how to make adjustments. So I didn't make any even though this garment really needed a bust adjustment. The shoulders after some wear will start to slip down, and this is likely because the bust area isn't tight enough. There could be other reasons for this as well, but knowing my own body, I suspect that this is the culprit. The dress buttons up at the back, though I keep having this issue with the buttons falling off, likely due to the material I chose. So as you can see here, a couple of the buttons are missing. I just need to re-sew them on for the fifth time and possibly 
probably come up with a better solution. The day gown is mostly unlined, except for the bodice area, which I lined with a thin cotton, messily whip stitching the raw edges for a little extra security. The buttonholes are, of course, sewn by hand, and these are actually my very first buttonholes, which I feel like is a milestone in many historical dressmakers' journeys. Little did I know there would be so many more buttonholes to come. While this garment is a great first attempt, I have come a very long way with my sewing skills, which only shows us that even if your first garment doesn't come out the way you expected it to, you have to keep practicing and you have to keep trying. In all, this dress took me around 40 hours to hand sew. With my third creation, I decided to step it up a notch. I felt fairly confident at this point in understanding some of the very basics, and I was ready for a bit of a challenge. Was I ready enough to make an entire three-piece Georgian Redingo ensemble? Probably not, but this is part of my personality. I love to take massive leaps and just go for things and deal with the challenges when they arise. It's a great way to train the brain to problem solve and develop solutions, which I think is a skill that so many can benefit from. This Redding Go is in a 1780s style. If you'd like to see it in greater detail, I have made a lookbook for the outer part of the garment, though in that lookbook I styled it with a white fish shoe and petticoat, which I did not make. The outer part of the Redding Go is made from a hunter green pure wool suiting, and the fichu and petticoat are made from a heather cotton. I knew when planning this project I wanted a striking green and purple combination, as a little ode I think to Celtic culture which I've always felt quite connected to. The brass ornate buttons further support this theme. And the most exciting part of this garment, in my opinion, is the structure of the back. I love the combination of the complex 18th century panels along with the giant layered collars, which gives the style of Red and Go its signature look. I also adore how everything comes to a point and then flows outwards into a series of voluminous pleats. This garment is the first time I learned how to pleat, which is a skill that is extremely vital in historical sewing. The heather purple petticoat is heavily pleated as well in the traditional 18th century style of having two side slits that you can then use to access tie-on pockets. The back and front of the petticoat coat are duplicates, so in a sense this garment is reversible. The three pieces of this Redding Go took me somewhere around 100 or more hours to hand sew. I knew I wanted a winter solution for this ensemble as well, so I went ahead and sewed a matching 18th century cape. The cape is made from a green boiled wool, and it closes with a twill tie at the neck. There are slots as well for your arms to go through. I really love the collar and hood combination in the back. It only took me around 15 to 20 hours to hand sew. Wools that don't fray are a wonderful way to cut back on sewing time because they require very little finishing. I absolutely adore riding habits and 18th and 19th century garments based off of menswear due to their durability, practicality, and the fact that they were worn very much as utilitarian garments. Because of my lifestyle, which is quite connected to nature and the outdoors, it's important that I have many options that are easily worn outside, especially in uncertain weather conditions. For that reason, wool is an ideal material. I knew the next project I wanted to make was a riding habit, which is an extremely similar style garment to the Red and Go. The word Redding Go is actually based off the English term riding coat. Though neither the Redding Go nor the riding habit were worn exclusively for horse riding. In fact, both options were sometimes worn during many forms of travel. This riding habit is a 1740s style and it's made from a thick brown boiled wool lined with a chocolate brown linen. I also added in a thicker linen as an interfacing because I wanted this to be an immensely dense ensemble so that it could be ideal for winter. To be honest, this outfit is so warm that I don't exactly need an overcloak to feel comfortable, but in especially cold places, a garment like this with a cape on top could be an ideal solution for staying warm. Funnily enough, I can also wear this on hot days. For instance, the day featured in this clip was rather warm, and yet due to the linen and wool combination, I felt completely comfortable. This riding habit has so many buttons, which is quite common for this style. Some of the buttons are decorative, but the majority of them are completely functional, which only adds to the practicality of this garment. Funnily enough, when I filmed my historical wardrobe tour, I completely forgot to include this garment. I even had it laid out and everything ready to shoot, but somehow it got missed. So you are all getting to see an in-depth overview of the garment now. With regards to aspects that I learned from, the first 
First was the collar. This was my first time making a standard coat collar like this and I made this collar completely the wrong size. So it just kind of hangs awkwardly. It cannot function as a turned up collar, but when turned down, it seems to just blend in. So it wasn't the end of the world and I didn't bother to redo it. Additionally, I hadn't yet realized at this point how short-waisted I am and so I didn't shorten the pattern of the bodice, which is now the first adjustment I make with any pattern. That's why there is some of this excess material, I think, at the top by my upper back. I felt for this video it was important to show the inside of every garment so you can all see that historical sewing does not have to be perfect to look decent on the outside. Nowhere near it, in fact. Even extant garments are so far from perfect, especially when you look on the inside. I did at least fully finish this garment, however, which felt like a huge success because sometimes I'll end up leaving a seam or two unfinished, which I will typically get back to at a later point. Under the jacket, I made a petticoat similarly pleated to the heather purple one from the last project. This ensemble took me around 100 hours to hand sew. By the time I entered into my next project, I was still very much in the riding habit 18th century mood. In fact, I devised a plan in my head that I would keep making different variations of the riding habit until I felt like I really understood its construction. Luckily, by the end of this project, which is a four-piece 1770s style ensemble, I felt like I could move on to other periods in history. Before making some of the outer garments for this set, I knew I wanted to sew a riding habit shirt. These types of shirts were worn throughout the 18th century primarily by women, though they are based off of the men's shirt from the same period. The primary difference is its form-fitted nature due to the pleating at the back along with being attached to ties, and the garment is also shorter and not full length. This was likely in order to accommodate the tighter outer garments for greater comfort. If I could go back and do things differently, I would have remade this collar. Though I did measure it, it ended up being a bit too small, so I can't button it shut because it would be far too constricting. For that reason, I either wear it folded down or turned up with a neckerchief wrapped around. This shirt is made from a white linen, as is traditional, and it took around 25 hours to hand sew. The next element of the ensemble was the waistcoat. I had to make significant alterations to the pattern because my measurements are somewhat unusual, which is a nice reminder that you do not have to fit into any sized article of clothing. Clothing needs to be designed in a size to fit you. And I think that is something our society can benefit deeply from remembering because it completely alters the standard narrative around fashion in the Western world today. I constructed this waistcoat from a gold cotton satin front and a blue cotton drill back, lining it with a loom state cotton that I had to wash quite thoroughly. The loom state cotton is thick and structured, which I think gave a nice support to the garment. The buttonholes I decided to make in a contrasting blue silk thread for an extra decorative element. And the buttons are made from a copper or brass, which is slightly oxidized to create bluish green specks, which I think paired wonderfully with the blue tones of the garment. The petticoat was next, and this one I made exactly like the other two. Finally, it was the most complex part of the ensemble, the jacket. I really wanted the waistcoat underneath to pop, so I knew I needed to make the jacket in the blue cotton drill, also because it would help to give the garment more structure. And I ended up decorating the front with this vintage gold ribbon, which adds another tone of gold into the mix. One trick I used for the collar to make it appear piped was actually just to line it with the gold satin, and instead of making the outer fabric larger than the lining, I sewed it together the other way around. I think this added a beautiful and subtle accent. This time around, I finally got the collar right, after two prior collar-related learning experiences. I lined the entire jacket in the gold satin as well, and I also added an interlining of a wool flannel just for some extra added warmth. I still have a couple of internal elements to finish in this jacket, one being the neckline raw edges and the other being the waist seam that attaches to the skirt. At some point soon, I plan to complete these. All four pieces of this historical outfit probably took me around 200 hours to hand sew. After such a massive set of projects, I decided to work on something a little more base layer and simple. 
I filmed an 18th century winter under petticoat tutorial as a result of this, in the process of course sewing an under petticoat. This under petticoat is made from a thin but warm wool flannel and it took only around 6 hours to sew and that is also with having to film the process, which many of you probably know automatically makes the project twice as long to complete. If you would like to hand sew an under petticoat like this for yourself, definitely be sure to check out this tutorial which I've linked in the cards. It's an especially beginner-friendly project and versatile because you could also use this video to make an outer petticoat or even a history-bounding skirt. After this extended stint in the 18th century, I decided to close this chapter and progress into another era that I love to wear, the Victorian period. I had been eyeing an 1890s walking suit in Patterns of Fashion 2 basically since I began sewing, but I always felt like it was an ensemble that I would make one day when my skills were advanced and I understood historical sewing on a deeper level. But it dawned on me that maybe I could actually sew this ensemble now. I should say that I basically had no idea what I was doing 95% of the time, yet I still managed to make a creation that I'm very proud of. In fact, this is the creation I am still the most proud of as of yet. Making this ensemble, however, was no easy feat. It took around three months of my life, and if we consider that this is my first year of sewing and review, this project alone took one-fourth of that time. I began with the bodice, which was the most complex aspect and took around 300 hours to hand sew. I made it from a terracotta cotton twill, and I won't go into details about the process because I actually filmed a two-part video on the in-depth construction of this ensemble, which I have linked in the cards. So if you are curious what exactly went into making this project, definitely be sure to refer to that video. Here I have paired up the bodice with a skirt that I did not make because at this point I had yet to sew the skirt. Once the bodice was complete, however, I did finally move on to the skirt, which I managed to throw together in 10 days because I had promised a certain date for the video release, so I ended up having to sew frantically. I did still enjoy the process, of course. I was just extremely tired after all of that stitching and editing. I think the skirt adds a completely new element to the ensemble and it took about 100 hours to hand sew making this walking suit a whopping 400 hour project. If there were things I could go back and change, I actually wouldn't change anything. The garment is far from perfect and frankly I would never want it to be perfect because I think it has so much character exactly the way it is. I absolutely learned more than I could ever imagine from this replication, especially considering this was my very first time sewing any type of Victorian garment. Oh, and I almost forgot. I made a little hat for the ensemble too, which only took a few hours, so it was an immensely straightforward project, but helped to top off everything. No pun intended. I was on to another quick little project after this one. I just wanted to make a simple work apron from a black wool flannel that was in my stash. This apron took around four hours to hand sew. One thing I really wanted to accomplish this summer was the construction of a Victorian bathing suit. I don't actually enjoy swimming or being in the water all that much, so it's amazing I even got in this far. But I figured it would be a great garment to own to lounge around the shore in especially because it would help to cover most of my skin, aiding in protecting me from harmful UV rays. I'd still wear sunscreen too though, of course. This is an 1880s style bathing costume, and traditionally these were often made from thin wool flannel, but I opted for contrasting shades of linen from my stash. That's because linen actually dries really well and helps to keep you cool in hot weather, so it felt like this would be a wonderful solution for an outdoor waterside ensemble. The main suit portion closes with a series of buttons. I used some antique mother of pearl buttons that I got from a lot which are currently in my stash. The main suit is then covered with a skirt which I made from a black wool flannel, the same one I used for the apron. And the waistband is linen. This closes with a button and some hooks and eyes. Finally, the entire look is topped off by this adorable little hat which is made from the same wool flannel and lined with a thin cotton. The ensemble in all took me about 50 hours to hand sew. The final garment I made this year is another outer garment which is meant to help with warmth. It's called a talma. There is a lot of conflicting information online about when the talma was actually worn and what distinguishes a talma from some of the other similar outer garments like the mantle. I am definitely not qualified to give you accurate further information on this because I don't know and I'm also not a historian, but from what I can tell the talma was definitely worn during the mid-Victorian period. Some resources say it was worn 
in the early Victorian period. Others also say it was worn into the bustle era. Regardless of what is true, the talma I decided to make is from a brownish yellow moleskin or fustian as it used to be called, lined from some random stash linen I had left from my bathing suit. I should mention that I definitely did not sew the silk gown that I'm wearing underneath the talma, but I needed something nice to represent the talma well, so I felt this would be a great pairing. I didn't quite have enough of the linen fabric, so I had to piece the lining a bit, and I didn't realize you would end up seeing the lining from underneath when the garment is worn, so I decided to face the lining with this funky green pure silk from my stash. It's very smooth and lightweight, and I felt the colors would look gorgeous together. To finish the entire thing off, I decorated the talma with some gold fringe and military braid. This entire project took me around 35 hours to hand sew. I hope that you've enjoyed this video documentation of everything that I've made during my first year sewing. There is definitely way more sewing content in the future to come. Even though I don't only make historical sewing content for this channel, I know it is something that a lot of you really enjoy, and so I try to put out as much as is possible, but of course it does take longer because of the whole hand sewing element. But I can promise you that there is definitely more to come. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all on Thursday for another video.